At one of the lowest points in my life, I ended up in a psychiatric facility for two weeks. It doesn't sound that long, but when you have nothing to do in a small building all day, every day, it felt like months. You really get to know people in there in a short amount of time. Some kind people, some I wish I'd never met. I was with an abusive guy at the time, but that's another story. My teacher had discovered my plans for suicide, and I was Baker acted. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's basically where you can call and report if someone seems unstable or wanting to hurt themselves. And they take you to the facility for up to three days if they believe you may have a mental illness. At nine in the morning, I was questioned by police. I was taken to the hospital after a general exam. It was 3 p.m. by the time I was taken to the facility. The building didn't look like much from the front. I remember walking in and being escorted through a series of long hallways. Eventually, I was placed in a waiting room with several other people, just barely enough seats for everyone. I took the only open seat beside an old man who promptly started touching himself under his blanket. I just leaned really far over to the wall and didn't look at him, trying to ignore him. Thankfully, he was soon called after that. One by one, the people in the room were escorted out. I was the last one there, and it was now nighttime. They turned the lights off in the waiting room, and I got a little worried. I just sat there like, of course they forgot about me. It's not that unimportant. There was no supervisors around or anything, but there was a camera. Eventually, someone was leaving to lock up and saw me in there. They got me squared away. Halfway through the process, I heard angry screaming and saw orderlies running towards it. They tackled a patient and took him out of the main floor. Soon, I was strip searched and I was given temporary clothes and a room in the women's ward. It was 11 p.m. when they released me into the main facility. I remember wondering how I never noticed how big this place was from the outside. Lights out was about 10 p.m., but one of the doctors gave me a plate of food since I'd not eaten that day. Immediately, I was greeted by another patient, an elderly black lady who was just so sweet. She told me she was pregnant and was eating for two and asked for my pudding. I chuckled, assuming she was joking. And I did. But as she spoke, I realized she wasn't joking. She thought she was pregnant and her husband was coming to get her soon. She was kind of sad, but harmless. The first night, I didn't sleep a wink. Another woman was in my room and she had to be on 24-hour watch. The first few days were very surreal. Wake up at 7 a.m., take vitals and medicate, afternoon. Vitals and Medicaid, night. Vitals and Medicaid. There was nothing to do there all day, every day. In the adult facility, the woman's ward was on the left and the men's on the right. Patients were allowed to intermix during the day. Rowdy or dangerous patients were not allowed to interact and were in the quiet rooms. Quiet rooms were two rooms between the wards that had windows on the doors and they were soundproof. Some particularly bad patients were strapped down and sedated. I'd already made friends with some of the patients. In the ward, we all exchanged phone numbers as a gesture of friendliness. I was understood that nobody actually keeps them after they get out. It was just a basic way of conveying, you are not my enemy. And believe me, though many people came and left once their Baker Acts ran out, there were cliques and groups drama, and factions. I tried to be cool with everybody, and so most of the patients and staff liked me. That's when I met Alphonse. Alf was a big, burly guy with a lot of anger issues. I've always favored the underdogs, and so I made friends with him. We exchanged numbers to show that we were cool with each other. But after, things got a bit strange. I learned that he was the one the staff tackled my first night. He would commonly yell and throw things at the staff. The furniture in the ward was blocky kid furniture that was filled with sand. I'm not exaggerating when I say they were hard to push around. Alf once picked up a sand-filled chair and threw it at one of the orderlies, 
missing and slamming against the wall. He was very, very strong. Eventually, the doctors convinced me to sign a voluntary admittance since my Baker Act was up. They said I wasn't ready to go home. Honestly, I felt I wasn't either. Though the ward has its issues, I'd rather have been there than with my abuser at the time. So I stayed. Over Christmas, but I'm getting off track. All fawns who proclaimed to be homosexual started magnetizing me. It was clear I was his only friend in there. He started questioning what it would be like to be with a woman and that I could be his first. Obviously, I was not interested and loyal to my current relationship. His advances didn't stop. He would talk to me about running away together, living together, and tried to get me in the bathroom with him daily. It was starting to get to the point where it was freaking me out. He started getting angry when I talked to other people in the ward. One day, I was playing cards with some nice people in there that I became pretty close friends with in a short time. Alf came over, looked right at me, and said, You're a fucking traitor, bitch, and proceeded to kick our table over with massive force. He started at me, but the orderlies were quick to grab him. I was protected in there. He was in isolation for a couple of days. Once he got out, he seemed genuinely sorry and asked me to forgive him. I said sure, because what's the harm, right? Better not to have massive, angry enemies in a small space. His sister even called and thanked me for being his friend, because he never really had any. It seemed good for a while no happenings, but his sexual advances started again. Some sounded like hints of threats. He started to get angry when I would refuse him, but the day finally came and I was cleared for release. Out of the ward and finally home, I didn't really look back, but calls started coming in. It was Alf using his phone time to call me. At first, I thought he'd forget about it in a couple of weeks without me being there or talking much. But he didn't. Alphonse called for about two months until finally I stopped answering. Then I got a call from an unknown number one day. It was him. He was released from the ward. He would call me from different numbers, pressuring to find me and start a life with me. By this point, I was pretty scared of him. I told my parents and boss in case he ever found me or showed up at my work. I never went to the police, though, because nothing technically happened. He'd become irate and scream on the phone and make inappropriate comments a lot, but nothing physical. It's not like he knew where I was. I had accidentally destroyed my phone and was without it for about a year. Once I'd gotten a new one, I had forgotten all about this. I never thought he'd be back, especially calling a deadline for so long. But, right after I got a new phone, same number, calls immediately started again from Alf. Like he was just calling every single day and waiting. It's like nothing had changed. The comments, the anger, the wanting to run away together. I got spooked again. Finally, the last time he called, he informed me he was in state. The state mental hospital. Generally, the next step from the ward I was in. My phone was soon deactivated, and I've not had a phone since, about three years now. I got a Google Voice number and have never heard from him again. I'm afraid we might run into each other again someday. I met many people in the ward, some far gone, some just down on their luck. A lot of humbling experiences and good people, but Alf was the only one that scared me. Though he never got the chance to hurt me, I always wonder what he could have done. His temper was so unpredictable and nasty, and he was such a big guy. I'm really glad he never found me outside of the ward, and I hope we never meet.